During my original $350 AMD Ryzen APU build video, some of you were impressed with the gaming performance it had to offer, and some of you wound up a little disappointed. Well, in this incredibly late follow-up, I'm going to show you how to squeeze quite a bit of extra performance out of your Ryzen APU build with some fairly easy steps, like a lot of performance. Let's jump in after a word from our sponsor. For a quick review, though I definitely recommend watching the previous build video where I covered all of this before watching this one, linked in the video description, we built a $350 Ryzen APU system with the AMD Ryzen 2200G, a kit of two 4GB sticks of 2400MHz DDR4 RAM, a cheapo silicon power 240GB SSD, the beastly Rosewill Blackhawk case on a great sale, and the Seasonic 520W power supply. I used the MSI B350M Pro VD Plus motherboard, but that required an AMD boot kit and a BIOS update to run the APU since I started early. I recommended the ASRock uh, AB350M Pro 4 motherboard instead, as it's already ready to go for the APUs without an update. Performance was decent on medium to low settings in CSGO, Fortnite ran great, Crisis ran okay, Warframe ran amazing, and games like Paladins and Smite ran really fast. Iron Sight was a solid experience too, but games like Doom, PUBG, and more demanding titles weren't really playable. Well, that changes today. Like, a lot. Let's talk setup first. To get the very best out of your system, there's a few steps that you need to do. Firstly, if your motherboard has easy profiles for RAM like this MSI motherboard does, spend some time finding a good overclock for your RAM. In the last video, I questioned whether it would be better to have faster single channel or slower dual channel RAM. Well, you need both. You, you want both. These settings are in your BIOS settings, accessed by hitting the appropriate F key or the delete key when it posts the motherboard logo when you're starting up the computer, and then going to advanced settings and exploring that mode looking for the overclock settings. The Patriot kit I got worked on the first try with the second set of 3200 MHz timings profile. This is a huge 800 megahertz overclock on the RAM and it helps rise in performance a lot and beats the stock speeds of that single stick. Now, to figure this out for yourself will be annoying and there's a reason I recommend doing it first. In order to try these, you just have to apply them. Go for the looser timings first. Take note if any work, go to exit, save changes, let it reboot. If it reboots and posts the BIOS logo and such, you're probably good. If the screen never comes back up and it just keeps rebooting, then that setting didn't work. You need to hard shut down the system by holding the power button until it kicks off and the lights go off. Next, flip off the switch on the back of your power supply, which cuts off power to the entire system. Open your case, pull out the CMOS battery, a little watch-like battery uh, that's somewhere on the motherboard. Use the tab to lift it up and wiggle it out. Leave it sitting out for a minute or two, pop it back in, turn on the power supply, and boot the PC. This clears out your BIOS settings so that you can start over. This is why I recommend doing this first so you don't keep wiping the important steps that we're gonna do later every time you need to do this. Alternatively, if you have a clear CMOS button on your motherboard or the back IO, you can probably use that, but my motherboard doesn't have it. This step is trial and error until you get a setting that can boot. Each RAM kit will be different, but this 3200 megahertz setting worked for my Patriot kit. A crucially important step to improve performance with this build is to increase the am available amount of VRAM, or video RAM, available to the graphics part of the APU. By default, it reserves only 256 megabytes for itself, which is something you'd expect from a high-end graphics card from 2004. <laughs> under your, in your BIOS, under Settings, Advanced, Integrated Graphics Configuration, change the UMA frame buffer size, or VRAM, to from 256 megabytes to maximum, which should be two gigabytes. If you have more than four gigabytes for, of RAM for your system. If you have eight gigabytes, that's perfect. If you have a four gigabyte RAM system, this will likely cause problems due to there only being two gigs left for the rest of your system. But please don't build something with four gigabytes of RAM in 2018, unless it's running Linux or Windows XP or something old. Exit and save changes. Anytime you need to clear the CMOS or reset the BIOS due to other changes, you will need to come back and apply the setting as it is hugely important. Next, it's time to overclock the CPU a little bit. In my testing, I could not push it too far, so if there is a game boost mode or auto overclock tool built into your BIOS, you can probably just enable that and be fine. On my motherboard, that gave me a free overclock from 3.5 to 3.75 gigahertz. If you do want to push it further, turn the game boost or whatever off 
change the CPU ratio to something like 38 for 3.8 gigahertz and leave everything else on auto, except your RAM timings and the VRAM settings that we changed earlier. I had no problem getting 3.85 gigahertz stable without changing voltages or anything more complicated. Then you can run a free stress test, such as Prime95, linked in the video description, for 30 minutes or so and make sure that it stays cool and stable. I'm using CoreTemp, another free program, to make sure the CPU doesn't get too hot. Using the stock Wraith cooler included with the APU, it gets quite toasty, but nothing dangerous or problematic. If you want to spend 20 to 40 bucks on a better, cheaper tower cooler, you'll definitely be fine temperature-wise. As long as there are no errors in the four threads in the Prime95 test after 30 minutes or so, and you're not holding like 95 degrees the whole time, then you're probably good to go. If there are errors, or it runs too hot, reboot back into BIOS and lower that number to 37 or 37.5, or just use the Game Boost mode. You can, in theory, do the CPU and GPU overclocking in the Ryzen Master software that you can download from AMD. It's a software utility that runs in Windows and allows you to adjust things there instead of going into the BIOS and messing with settings that may look a little more scary. However, I have found it to not be all that useful. The default values weren't entirely accurate and I couldn't even get the same results that I got in, bio in BIOS working fine with Ryzen Master. So that's up to you. It reads the default GPU speed as 400 megahertz, which is nowhere near correct. So good luck. It's kind of disappointing because I was kind of sold on software overclocking lately given that Intel's extreme tuning utility has been very easy to overclock my i9. But Ryzen APUs already have a lot of quirks and we'll discuss that later. Next up is an overclock that, should, that you should be prepared for issues with. If you want to skip this step, that's fine. If it gives you issues, it can give you a lot of headaches. But you have the potential to gain a lot of performance here. In the BIOS setting, under the OC section, and under CPU ratio, you should have GPU clock frequency and GPU core voltage. Leave GPU core voltage on auto or set it to 1.2 volts if you're trying a higher frequency. But then frequency is going to be fun. Some insane people can apparently push the GPU to 1650 megahertz, although that kept giving me threadlocked blue screens. 1450 megahertz seems to be a more commonly stable speed, but that kept crashing for weird in weird ways for me as well. I wound up having to back it down to only 1240 to 1300 megahertz to have any sort of real stability. Still random blue screens or quirks that seem to be driver related, but even that tiny amount of overclocking from the I believe 1200 base speed seems to help. To confirm that it's working, you can just play a game or run a free benchmark like Superposition. You can also use the number generated by this benchmark to see any improvements gained by the tweaks that you make, graphics wise. One last thing before we get into the games, limit what background processes you have running. Like really limit them. I never listen to this advice, but do it. Close anything you're not using, and even Windows Defender uses up a fair bit of resources. While I cannot, in good faith, recommend leaving Windows Defender disabled all of the time, disabling it during gaming netted me huge gains in benchmarks. Almost 2,000 points in 3D Mark Skydiver, almost 700 points in 3D Mark Cloudgate, and about 120 points in the Superposition benchmark. To turn off Windows Defender's real-time protection, hit Start, click the Settings cog, Update and Security, click Windows Security on the left, and then click on Virus and Threat Protection, and then click on Virus and Threat Protection Settings. They bury it. But there, turn off real-time protection. Again, this is risky if your network doesn't have good security and you don't have good practices, but disabling it only during gaming should be okay. Decide for yourself if it's worth the risk with the performance gains. I'm not responsible for what happens if you download a virus. On to the games and Vox Marks. I mainly wanted to test games that struggled last time or would have significant improvements this time around, as well as a couple new games that have come up since, well, April. <laughs> With the CSGO benchmark map, last time I ran things on medium and 4x MSAA and recommended maybe knocking it down to low. With the all new with all the new settings, I was able to crank it up to high with shader detail on very high and MSAA on 8x, and we still averaged 65.8 FPS with the only big brutal smoke area struggling. During actual gameplay, the average frame rate was 77 FPS. That's on high instead of medium. Insane gains. Now, there was a couple loading hiccups when I first got into the map for a minute or two, but during real gameplay, like that would be resolved by a warm-up round, and the rest of the match after that first minute or so was smooth as butter. 
Ironside was able to be kicked up to high settings for most settings. I wound up turning down anti-aliasing to average or low, and it still sometimes struggled when there was a lot of alpha effects or transparent stuff like smoke, fire, the on-screen red blood indicator, etc. on screen, but matches averaged 61 FPS on high and 103 FPS on average settings, so definitely a good bump from there. The Realm Royale Alpha isn't hard to run, but at 1080p and everything on max, I got an average of 110 FPS with a 1% low of 57.3 FPS. Doesn't get much better than that. Unlike last time, Doom 2016 was actually playable. Running in Vulcan mode with the same settings as last time, frame rates weren't too much higher with an average FPS of about 39.9 FPS, but it actually felt responsive enough during gameplay to be an enjoyable experience. Menus were still very sluggish and unresponsive, however, that was weird. I also wanted to test the PUBG Mobile emulator from Tencent. I ran uh, on medium game graphic settings with an unlocked frame rate, anti-aliasing disabled, and so on, and the game ran wickedly well. There's three different settings menus to look at, by the way, plus the low, medium, high setting when you first launch the game. But since it ran so well, I cranked everything up to the max. Full Ultra HD 2K, extreme settings, everything as high as possible in every setting menu I could find, and I still averaged 52 FPS during an entire match, and it was a very enjoyable experience. I got a couple wins out of it too. There's still about 60% bots in this game due to the player segmentation, but it's still fun for casual play, especially when I'm only half paying attention to it in order to benchmark. PUBG itself, the Steam version, runs alright, with everything on low, on very low instead of view distance, which was on high or ultra, I averaged 41 FPS and it was more than playable compared to last time. But that was on a previous Windows install. My fresh install of Windows 10 18.03 has some issues. More on that in a minute. Minecraft can now hold a lock to 120 FPS most of the time and dropping down to 90s at night. Sweet. Crisis ran a little better with 45 FPS being kind of the low end, and I saw it reaching over 60 FPS at times. Fun. Overall, I was very impressed with the huge performance gains seen by all of the tweaks that I made to this system, but the whole experience that for me has been filled with many headaches. I had to do all of my rounds of benchmarks like four or five times, after it became clear the 1450 MHz on the GPU wasn't stable, after I went and reinstalled Windows 10 due to constant blue screens, after I decided Windows disabling Windows Defender was worth the gains, there seems to be some disagreement between the Ryzen APUs and Windows 10. The driver doesn't get along well, Windows 10 1803 just hates it, it's a mess really. I, I thought I was crazy at first, but there's a lot of forum threads about issues similar to what I have been experiencing, and I actually stumbled upon two different Jay's Two Cents videos, I was about to call them Jay-Z, where he ran into similar glitchiness and discovered that AMD was even distributing the wrong driver and a lot of other nonsense. I'll have those linked in the description below as well. Sometimes I'll get a thread locked in process blue screen. Every once in a blue moon, I'll get an error bad config blue screen. This was especially problematic in the old Windows 10 install and when I was trying to upgrade it to 1803, which is why I did a fresh install. And two games, only two out of all that I have tested, just flat out don't work somehow. Skyrim Special Edition, as soon as it launches, inverts the system colors and the game. Even after I close it, I have to reboot to fix things. PUBG now launches and just totally glitches the colors out altogether, something I haven't seen since like Windows 98. This normally only affects the game and only in full screen or full screen windowed mode, but when I tried getting around it by running in a normal window and forcing it borderless full screen using the app, it froze and turned the entire system into a glitchy mess that I had to hard reset. And this is even with the GPU overclock disabled. I have really no idea what is going on here, and at this point I'm happy to blame the APU because, holy cow. APUs always seem to have some weird little quirks, but this is just kind of bonkers. But otherwise, this is a beastly little gaming PC, and definitely has been a huge bang for the buck outside of those issues. Hopefully AMD can get their crap together and get this resolved, because I would love to see more APUs widely utilized for budget gaming. This has certainly been an experience, but I do feel that the value per dollar of the build is well worth it, and that 520 watt power supply means that you can add in a beefy GPU later, up to a GTX 1070 even, though a 1050 Ti or 1060 would be a smarter choice, and get even more gaming power out of it once you get a little bit more budget. 
product links, and the first build video will be in the description down below. Down there, there is a link to our sponsor, Lorax Technology. Check them out. While you're at it, subscribe and enable notifications so you don't miss an episode or a video or something if YouTube wants to work. I'm Evil's Vox. I'll see you in the next one.